episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all. It explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. Whether you love them or hate them, if you've ever developed software professionally for long enough, there is a very good chance that you have been a part of a code review. Whether it was for code that you wrote or you were doing a review for someone else's code, in this episode we're going to take a look at code reviews and if they can actually be useful for improving code quality, if that's actually something they do, or if it's just some review process that management wants developers to go through because of reasons and getting into some of the reasons why developers don't like them. So that's coming up in this episode, but first let's start off with our trivia question for the week. So what American tech company had a microprocessor facility in Costa Rica that at one time was responsible for 20% of Costa Rican exports and 5% of the company's GDP? So what was that American company's name? And that is your trivia question for the week. Now, I want to roll right on into this week's cybersecurity tip. Up, 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 hold that thought uh, past me. Hi there, Dark Assassin from the future here. And uh, before we get into this week's cybersecurity tip, I just need to interject for a quick second because after I recorded this episode, CrowdStrike thought it would be a great idea to essentially blow up the internet. So I had to uh, come in here after the fact and re-record this portion of the episode, or rather interject this portion of the episode. So of course CrowdStrike didn't actually blow up the internet, but they uh, metaphorically did with all of the uh, computers that were rendered bricks and uh, displaying that lovely Windows blue screen of death. So what exactly happened here? So the software that in question is called CrowdStrike Falcon, um, which in this particular case operates uh, as a Windows driver. So it operates with kernel level privileges uh, when it comes to its execution. And essentially what that means is it executes at even higher level privileges than being an administrator. So it, it, it's the real deal. Um, so I guess as a quick bit of background, CrowdStrike is, is basically a cybersecurity company, um, very heavily involved in the enterprise world. Uh, but it's it's important to note that I believe this uh, issue uh, only affected the Windows version of its software, since I know it also has a Mac OS version as well. Uh, but this one in particular that got pushed to Windows was causing the, like I mentioned, the beautiful blue screen of death. So the reason why it operates as a driver with kernel level privileges is so that it can monitor everything that's going on your system in order to detect viruses and other malware. And this is not necessarily uncommon for, you know, security tools and antivirus type programs to do because in order to be able to access everything you need to access on the system to ensure that there isn't any malware or viruses doing anything funky, you kind of need to have uh, some high level of permissions. Uh, And of course, with that comes a certain level of trust that you have to put into that either that security company or antivirus company or whatever uh, in order to give them that level of access to your system. So that's a little bit of a background. So how did this crash actually happen? Well, it's actually kind of funny because on Thursday night into, I guess, Friday morning sometime in those wee hours, an update got pushed that somehow contained a file which had all zeros or was all null. Now, I'm not entirely sure how that happened, but that's what happened. So what 
happens then is the CrowdStrike driver then tries to access said file that is completely empty with nothing but zeros, and then the portion of the file that it thinks it's accessing doesn't actually exist. It's pointing to null, which causes a crash, which causes the kernel panic, which causes the blue screen of death. And the reason why it happens with the CrowdStrike driver is because blue screens of death only happen when kernel level code runs into some kind of issue like this and crashes, which is why if you're writing a generic Windows program and you encounter some kind of like seg fault or something or null reference, you don't cause a blue screen on the system unless you do something really, really messed up. But even then, I don't think you can. I think it's only if you're operating with kernel level privileges um, as like a device driver, for instance. So that's basically how it caused the blue screen. But the reason why this took down essentially the entire internet is because how CrowdStrike, the CrowdStrike driver is set up, it's basically set to start at boot, which essentially means that in order for Windows to boot properly and be con considered secure, the CrowdStrike driver has to be loaded. But as we already established, when the CrowdStrike driver runs and is loaded, it encounters this null pointer instance and crashes and causes a blue screen of death. So essentially you get this nice loop where nothing can boot and hence the internet explodes. Um, and yeah, so that's why you, the blue screen of death was everywhere and constantly circulating. So in, in order to fix this, the, the fix was actually semi-simple. All you really had to do was boot into safe mode or I think Windows recovery or something. It, basically, you boot into a mode where the external device drivers don't get loaded, so CrowdStrike won't get loaded, and then you find this c 000029 starsys file. Uh, I think I added enough zeros in there. Um, but yeah, you find this one sys system file uh, in the CrowdStrike folder under System32, and then you delete it, and then the system should boot as normal. Um, so who knows, maybe there actually is a little bit of truth to deleting the entire System32 folder on Windows to speed up your system. I kid, I kid. Uh, but with that, I just wanted to touch on that briefly. So now back to the episode with this week's cybersecurity tip. <laughs> This week's cybersecurity tip is kind of getting back to one of the core fundamentals of cybersecurity, which is limiting your attack surface as much as possible by disabling or uninstalling what you don't need. And I'm bringing this up because this week there was a new Cisco vulnerability where hackers were can it, uh, basically send malicious HTTP requests to allow for unauthenticated remote, uh, basically a remote access for an attacker to be able to change passwords of any user, including administrative users, and then be able to log in as those users and be able to do uh, whatever they wanted. So, <laughs> you know, back to the the worst of the worst, a remote exploit without authentication, and the remote attacker can get admin privileges. You got the, the what's that, the trifecta right there. Um, so yeah, pretty bad. So the Cisco advisory on the topic said, an attacker could exploit this vulnerability by sending crafted HTTP requests to an affected device. A successful exploit would allow an attacker to, to access the web UI or API with privileges of the compromised user. So in essence, if they compromised an administrator, they would have administrative rights. If they compromised a standard user, they would have whatever the standard user's rights were. So you can see why this is pretty bad because if you have the ability to send arbitrary API calls to a Cisco device, um, that could be uh, pretty bad. So the device in particular is the Cisco SSM on-prem, or I guess it was previously known as the SSM satellite. 
Um, and any releases earlier than version 7.0 are vulnerable. Now, Cisco mentioned that they weren't aware of this exploit act actively being exploited in the wild, although with how slow some people can be with upgrading or updating their systems, it's not unfeasible to think that this could be exploited in the wild in the future at some point. Because I still hear that there are some... Uh, cases of the log4j vulnerability being exploited in the wild and I don't know if you remember but that happened years ago and if I mean at this point if you're still running a vulnerable vulnerable version of log4j I really don't know what to tell you because you've had ample opportunities to update and you still haven't yet so it's it's questionable and I, and I guess you could make the argument that you need it for software compatibility reasons which I mean I guess but like at the same time come on um, and if you are running something like that that has some severe vulnerability like that you definitely should not be exposing it to the public internet that hackers can basically have a field day with and an exploit um, now, as far as the software itself, Cisco has uh, made software updates available. They have pushed a new software update. It's been released. Um, and yeah, so the reason, the main reason I kind of bring all this up is specifically the Cisco story, is routers and switches, especially in the enterprise world, are notorious for being managed through the CLI or the command line interface. So, for instance, if you were trying to get some kind of, like, Cisco certification, like the CCNA or something, um, pretty much everything in that that's, like, specifically Cisco-related, like, not necessarily the networking, you know, knowledge you need, like uh, VLANs and subnets and, and that kind of, and IP addresses and that kind of a thing, and the whole TCP IP stack and all that good stuff, the specific like commands that you need to know are commands. You don't like go through the web interface per se. Like it's like how what is like you know the command to you know set up a, a trunk port on this port and assign it to this VLAN or something like that. Um, most of the Cisco devices, at least that I'm aware of, um, are done through the command line interface now. Some like network gear, like switches and routers, do have web interfaces, um, but I think generally they are administered through the command line. And this poses a security vulnerability because, as we just see, saw here, you know, they if you didn't have the you know an HTTP interface even up or available, you wouldn't be vulnerable. Now I'm not. Now this this on-prem um, site thing that that uh, this vulnerability specifically is talking about, I believe this is dealing more with like certificate-based stuff. So it's not necessarily like a switch or a router or something like that. But the the point still remains that this that there have been issues in the past where some web interface of like a switch or something has had a similar vulnerability to this. So that that's kind of the one of the reasons why I'm bringing it up. So if you don't need the web UI, you might as well just disable it and just, you know, completely eliminate that attack surface that an attacker can get you at. Because having it enabled is just another avenue for attackers to try to hack you, right? Like if they can't get in through, you know, whether you have it configured through SSH or something, if they can't get through SSH, well, they might be able to get through the web interface. Now, personally... I would argue that any kind of switch or router interface that you have should not be <laughs> exposed to the public anyway. Um, I mean, that's just me. Um, but if you do have to expose it, the less you expose to the public internet, the better for obvious reasons. So for one, your attack surface is reduced and it, it, you, you don't have to look too far to realize why this is, is so key, right? Because if you reduce your attack surface, you essentially make a choke point of sorts 
where attackers really can only get you through one avenue. So if you basically choke down where the attackers can get you from, you can ensure and harden your defenses for those specific avenues rather than having to spread your resources across multiple different avenues, whether that's like a web UI or SSH. And this is why, like in warfare, for instance, you know, choke points are so valuable because if you if you can take a, a large force and condense them down into a smaller area, it makes it a lot easier to defend your position because there's only so many of the oncoming force can actually get through that choke point and it's a lot easier for a smaller team or army or whatever uh, to be able to fight off the larger one. And then the second one, is you have less to worry about when it comes to securing things, right? Like if you don't have the like the web UI enabled, you don't necessarily have to worry about ensuring that your your web interface is up to date like you do for other uh, interfaces that you have. Because if it's not even exposed or running or enabled, it's it's not really even a concern. Now, of course, if you you should still be updating, of course, um, but it's you know not one less thing that you really have to focus on when it comes to doing like security security audits and, and securing, you know, the the means of ingress, if you will. Um, so this is another reason why if you are, you know, running, say, like taking this back to, I guess, the home lab, uh, if you're running a home lab, one thing that I like to do is minimize what's running on what server. So for instance, I like to have dedicated servers with dedicated use cases. So for instance, I don't have one server that's running like 10 different services on it because that's just a massive attack surface. Um, I will have like an individual server running one specific thing. So for instance, instance, I have a server that's just running Jellyfin or I have a server that's just running my Bitwarden instance or I have a server that um, is just for um, testing code and developing for, right? So you, you, if you secure all these environments and you kind of divvy it up, you kind of can, you can minimize your attack surface and, and the things that are running. And you, it's just a, a best practice, if you will. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. And that is your cybersecurity tip for the week. Now, moving right into what nerdy stuff have I been up to this week? So we talked last week about the uh, Rock U 2024, which if you didn't listen to last week's episode, you should definitely go listen to that after this one. Uh, But as a quick recap, Rock U 2024 was essentially a dump of just shy of 10 billion, that's billion with a B, 10 billion passwords in it. Um, yeah, a lot that the, the final file size, I think is around like 140 some gigabytes uncompressed. The compressed version is like 46 or something like that. Um, so you might've kind of got an inclination from how I talked about it in last week's episode that I was potentially trying to get my hands on it. And this week I did get my hands on said password dump and I was trying to play around with it. Well, surprise, surprise, a 146-ish and change gigabyte file is not very um, susceptible to being opened with any sort of text editor or any way of viewing standard text. Now, granted, the data in the dump is just... Is just raw text, but um, <laughs> you're not going to be able to view it with, you know, your standard, like, text editor, right? So there are tools out there to help kind of search through the this, uh, this dump, and I found one in particular on GitHub, which uh, basically you, you search for a keyword, um, and it would basically parse through the dump and try to find instances of that keyword um, and it would output the number of instances of that keyword as well as how long it took to parse. So I, being the tinkerer that I am, I made some modifications to the code and just to kind of 
better fit my use case because I wanted to kind of actually see the results rather than just kind of get a number of this is how many hits you had. I want to see what those hits actually were. So I, I updated the search to basically output the results from the dump. And one thing I kind of noticed is because this program in particular was focusing specifically on like searching for keywords, um, you wouldn't necessarily get individ you wouldn't get like the exact match for a password. So what I mean by that is if you entered part of a pat it would give you basically part of a password. So for instance, if you searched one, two, three, four, you would get results not only for one, two, three, four, but also one, two, three, four, five, password one, two, three, four, etc. So any any password that contained one, two, three, four would count as a hit. So what I did was I essentially modified the code to collect all of those matches, essentially put them into a, a list, it was, a, it was in C, written in C++, so add them to a vector, and then basically put a, dump all those matches to a text file so I could view all the matches individually. And also I had a just a simple flag to specify if there was an exact match as well. Because one thing with the keyword hits is just because you get a hit on a keyword doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's the password itself. And what I mean by this is there's a hypothetical case. Personally, I didn't run into this, but I also didn't try every single password and combination in the book. But hypothetically, there is a chance that there is a password such as like ABC that isn't that doesn't exist by itself as a standalone password, but is a part of a larger password more complex password. So for instance, ABC might not be in the dump, but ABC123 is, and that would register as a keyword hit, but it would not register as an exact match, if that makes sense. So obviously this is a simple example for simplicity, um, and any kind of simple combination like that would obviously be show up. Um, but for slightly more complex passwords, there is, there is a chance that um, the keyword that you entered wouldn't necessarily by itself be a standalone password, but rather part of another password. So that's why I kind of added that flag in there just to check. Um, but uh, when it comes to how long it takes this thing to run, as you can imagine, it takes a while to uh, parse through 140, 46-ish gigabytes worth of data. Um, now, personally, under the most optimal conditions that I could run this under, which was putting the the dump of the, the passwords, the text file, on my NAS, which the reason I did it that way is to, one, reduce the network latency. So the first time I tried to run this, I essentially had it mounted as a SharePoint and then, uh, like, on just my local computer and then running the, the program against the, the SharePoint. So basically any time it was trying to get the next portion of the file, it was having to do a network request, which all kinds of latency there. I mean, we, we talked not too long ago about the uh, the importance of cache optimization and how you know big of a difference optimizing for cache performance makes now throw in network latency into the mix and it just you know balloons exponentially so the the most optimal way optimal way I could do was putting it on my NAS so there wouldn't be any kind of network latency and almost the entire file would have been able to be contained in RAM. Now, of course, not all of it. Um, my NAS, I think, has 128 gigs of RAM currently, so not the whole file could be in RAM, but probably a large chunk of it was and regardless it took around two and a half minutes to search each one of the keyword searches I did it took around two and a half minutes and for context the uh, the CPU that I have in my NAS is an E5 2660 V4 if that helps at all with with context for things now I, it also should be mentioned that this program specifically could have some severe could have some significant speed ups in regards to some potential optimizations for it. So 
specifically how this uh, program operates is because this file is so massive, it's not exactly something you can just read into memory like you do normally when you read in files into uh, your normal typical program. You generally read the entire file into some kind of buffer and then handle it that way. Well, that would be a ton of memory to allocate and you would probably run into some kind of issue and your operating system would be like, no, no, you're not doing this. Um, so the way that this program gets around it is essentially by chunking the file or taking reading in chunks at a time so it's configurable so I think the original version was like one megabyte I tested around with various sizes from one megabyte to 10 to 100 to even a gigabyte and at least when running on the NAS I didn't really notice much of a performance difference between how big the chunk was but the point of the matter is it because it's being divided up into chunks the program currently just runs and operates on a single thread and sequentially goes chunk by chunk so a simple I say simple um, the more of the, the simpler solution out of the couple that I'm going to suggest would be a multi-threaded approach. So because you are dividing this file up into chunks already, and really the how you how this works is because you have a singular file pointer that points to a specific point in the file itself, and then you essentially the chunk is however big. So in one case, a megabyte. A megabyte worth of data later is the endpoint, and then you start at that point, and then go another megabyte, and those how, uh, that's how you do your chunks. So you could essentially do the same thing, but divide it up and do it in a multi-threaded manner, where each thread is operating on a certain chunk of the file, and you can essentially drastically slice down the compute time by you know dividing up the file. So if it takes however many chunk let's go with the gigabyte because that's a little bit easier so say 146 gigabytes you put it into 146 chunks so if you can divide those 146 and do those in parallel that's definitely going to speed things up so you could do a multi-threaded approach and then once each thread finishes counting up all of their keywords and the chunks that they analyzed you can then join all those threads back together and then combine their results and then you can get your final result the other solution would be a map reduce approach which is uh, basically how distributed computer systems work on like a distributed file system like Hadoop for instance so this is essentially where you divide up the file into small chunks and then send those chunks across a cluster of nodes all performing a search on the on the chunks that they are given for the keyword in particular and then returning the result to you and then you can combine those into a singular result and in case you're wondering this is basically how search engines work in order to parse the massive amount of data that's out there on the internet and give you relevant results based on your search query very quickly um, so this is basically how, how Google works and how all the other uh, various search engines work. And even like other um, companies like uh, Facebook and Meta, they'll, they'll also use pretty much anyone that has a that operates on a distributed file system is going to do make use of some kind of map reduce um, algorithm where they basically take their massive data set divide it into small chunks send those chunks across their cluster of servers and then they can do all the processing there on a much smaller scale and then return all the results um, now of course there has to be quite the infrastructure here right you have to have a bunch of servers super fast networking to reduce as much late latency as possible but it really comes back to the massive amounts of parallelism that you can do and running all these all these searches sequentially and then returning and joining the results together um, so those are basically the kind of the two bigger approaches that I see that you could make to one of these like search um, programs uh, to search through the password dump in order to further optimize them and uh, make them better and faster. Um, but uh, getting kind of back to what I've discovered from the dump, to my surprise, 
Uh, one of my older passwords that I used to use, uh, which to be honest wasn't all that complex, uh, didn't show up in the dump. But the interesting part is the only difference between that password and a password I used before that was two characters, one of which was con changing one of the letters to be a capital and then adding a special character to it. So really two minor changes like that that add a decent amount of complexity, right? You know, you have uppercase, lowercase letters, as well as numbers and then special characters. So adding a mild addition of complexity, one extra character and changing one of the letters from lowercase to uppercase, that gave zero hits, but the version that didn't have that special character and didn't have that um, one letter change from lower to uppercase had multiple hits. So it's kind of crazy to think that just, you know, a minor tweak like that to a password and adding that minor bit of complexity can be the difference between your password, you know, being a, a commonly used password and more of a unique one that might not necessarily be in a password dump. So I, I found that to be very interesting. I spent several hours uh, playing around with this and uh, checking things, and, and it, was, it was definitely a fun time. Now, of course, uh, two and a half minutes in between searches was kind of cool. I will say I did kind of play a game with myself um, where I would, uh, you know, search a keyword and then see um, either the, the the number, you know, tick up so fast that you can't even see the individual numbers jumping. It's just, a you know, a massive increase. And then there's other times where it's like zero and just maintain zero. And you're like, oh, it, it might make it. And then all of a sudden it like jumps up to 15 or something like that. And you're like, no. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely fun and I had fun with it. And I'll probably continue to, to play around with it as well. Uh, but the other update I wanted to bring you all up to speed on is I have talked the past couple weeks now about trying to make a version of my elite encryption algorithm that I created in Swift. But before I did that, well, before I get to those updates, I did notice while I was doing some testing of the Swift version, uh, because I'm basically more or less doing a one-for-one one from the C implementation I did to the Swift version. I was doing some uh, testing with the C version, and I noticed that uh, I was able to cause a seg fault or essentially accessing memory that I shouldn't be uh, when I didn't enter any keys when uh, doing the ghost mode decryption. So I guess a little bit of a background here. The the ghost mode that I dubbed it was essentially a mode where you have to manually enter your keys in order to do the decryption, or in the case of encryption, it'll randomly generate keys, and those keys are not saved anywhere in memory. What they're, they're not saved to disk anywhere, so they only ever exist in memory. So kind of the point being is you kind of act like a ghost because uh, if you know how file systems work, when you delete a file, the file doesn't actually get deleted. It still exists. You just don't have anything pointing to it anymore. So depending on what kind of data recovery process your drive could go through, there's a chance that that data could be recovered and you know your keys could be recovered even if you deleted them but if they only ever exist in memory as soon as you know you you shut off your computer or whatever uh, that memory is gone and any trace of those keys is also gone with it so that was kind of the the point of ghost mode uh, but the issue was um, some some bozo that uh, wrote the C variant, oh wait, that's me, um, didn't adequately check for the edge case if someone didn't enter any keys, which then it would try to access those keys that weren't actually entered, and it would try to access memory that didn't exist. So theoretically, this probably could have been some kind of exploit, whether how you would actually perform the exploit, I'm not entirely sure because no data ever really got written there, although I'm sure if some was there, I mean, if you've looked at some of the crafty exploits that people have made that seem basically impossible and still managed to get some kind of arbitrary code execution to happen, I'm sure there there might have been a chance. Uh, but regardless, I, I discovered that, got that fixed. Um, so that was, was one of the things. But getting back into the Swift version, 
at this point, I think it's it's not as of recording, it's not done, but I would assume by the time that this episode goes out on Saturday, it probably will basically virtually be done. There's just a couple minor things that I want to uh, to touch on. So all the menus for managing keys, all of that's been implemented so you can add new keys, view keys, delete keys, all that good stuff. Encryption and decryption, both for fi- single files, both normal mode, ghost mode, directories, just straight text, all that's been implemented. So really the only thing that I want to kind of still look to do potentially is multi-threading directories just in case you have a massive directory and and just to kind of speed things up a little bit Uh, plus being able to learn how to do multi-threading in Swift that's kind of another learning thing that I kind of want to do but one of the other features that I added was to the Swift version specifically is I added base64 encoding to the output of the encrypted results One of the issues is currently the C implementation doesn't do that. So in order to maintain compatibility between the two, um, I basically added some checks to see if the the data you're trying to decrypt is encoded in base64 or not. And if it's not, just decrypt it. But if it is uh, encoded in base64, decode it and then decrypt. Um, Now I do plan once I get the this Swift version done, I do plan to kind of go back and add Base64 encoding into the C variant and possibly even the Java variant too, um, but especially at least the C variant um, and just kind of kind of bring those in line and kind of get them get them more more playing together because initially when I was making these implementations. The goal was never really to, <laughs> to make them interoperable. The main goal was just kind of sh- to show how you can implement this encryption algorithm in different languages. But then as I've kind of gotten on, I you know figured, you know, if you can encrypt it with one language, it should probably be able to, <laughs> any other variation of the program should probably be able to decrypt it. So the implementation should be similar enough. So for instance, like this is kind of where the base 64 encoding issue comes in, because if you if one implementation encodes it in base 64, the other implementation that doesn't do that wouldn't be able to decrypt it because the data is encoded in base 64, and not just the inco- the encrypted ciphertext. Right. So. Now, if you if actually in the, the I guess in the standard, if you can even call it that, the the actual write up I did of the encryption algorithm itself makes absolutely no mention of the result being encoded in base sixty four. It's just something I think that is more uh, more pleasing to look at. Um, it's a lot easier to print out and view the data uh, because you don't have random miscellaneous non-printable characters getting thrown into the mix. Um, but yeah, so that that's kind of something that I've been thinking about and, and planning on working on. But yeah, the Swift version at this point basically done. Just a couple minor things to touch up. And with that, let's get into the main topic of this week's episode, which is code reviews. And ironically, if the C variant that I made actually went through a code review, that seg fault of not checking if no keys were entered probably would have been caught. But of course, it didn't actually go through a code review, so here we are. Now, so getting into code reviews, let's, I guess, kind of start, if you're not uh, familiar with code reviews, if you're not from the software engineering world, basically a code review is just a process where, you know, a couple soft or a few software developers or engineers essentially examine each other's code to ensure it meets quality standards and is free from any kind of defects, whether that's bugs, security vulnerabilities, that kind of a thing. And the process can either be a manual process where you either have a some kind of like a pull request or something on your Git platform of choice, or you manually send out the code to the developers to look at, or it could be assisted with the use of automated tooling. So getting into kind of some of the pros and of code reviews and why they're important. 
So number one that everyone likes to harp on is it improves code quality. And the reason for this is kind of the consistency and the standards that can be upheld when going through a code review. Because if every time a portion of the code gets changed and has to be reviewed, it's a lot easier to enforce various coding standards, guidelines, and ensure that code is consistent, which if you've listened to previous episodes of the podcast, we kind of touched on this, where it's a lot easier to read, understand, and maintain code that is consistent. Because what, while you might not care if you are mixing and matching where you put your curly braces and if you have spaces between your parentheses or not, while you might not care if you're working in an enterprise or on some large code base, people are going to get mad at you if the code does not look the same throughout. Maybe it's an OCD thing, but at the same time, it can be quite jarring if you're kind of reading through code that all looks the same, and then there's this one section here that looks completely different. Um, It's like if uh, multiple people are kind of writing a book together, you generally put it through, you have some kind of um, standard or you have some editor kind of look through it to make sure that kind of all the, the people's different talking points kind of it all kind of sounds from the same voice, so it doesn't sound like three people wrote the book. It sounds like one person wrote the book. So kind of the same thing here with the code quality portion. Uh, Kind of the point is to ensure that it's all uniform and kind of looks like it was just written either, not necessarily by one person per se, uh, but it all is uniform, so which it makes it a lot easier for, for new programmers or even new developers to the project to get on board uh, with the code base. They don't have to worry about reading and reading through different code formats and different styles. Everything's uniform, so they can just focus on the code and what's going on. The other benefit to improving code quality is error detection. So if you have multiple people looking at the code, getting eyes on it, Um, They can better help catch bugs, logic errors, or even potential security vulnerabilities before it actually goes out in production. So kind of an example here is if a a reviewer might spot like a a missed null check or something um, that could potentially cause a runtime error, kind of like the that C version uh, of the elite encryption algorithm that I talked about where there were no keys entered, but uh, I didn't check for that and just kind of went about like there were keys entered. Um, Another example is this is actually one from my uh, personal professional work experience. I was in a, a code review and I noticed that the code that I was was reviewing uh, in one of the kind of print statements where it was trying to print out the, the data of this object was just printing out the object rather than specifying and converting that object to a string before printing it. Um, now, this was a totally honest mistake, and it is one that I had made mo- many, many times before. So uh, this is just kind of one of those things where if you have additional people looking at the code, they can they can catch things like that. Um, so that is one of the benefits of how it can imp- and how it can improve code quality. Another one that is sometimes talked about is the whole kind of like knowledge sharing and team collaboration aspect. And the the knowledge sharing is specifically important for the newer developers or the junior developers uh, that can learn and get more experience from colleagues colleagues during these code reviews. Um, So especially if you're either new to programming in general or new to the code base, being incorporated in these code reviews and kind of seeing how things are done um, and really kind of digging into the the nitty gritty portions of the code base can be a great way uh, to kind of come up to speed. Um, and having, having, you know, the additional insights from some more senior developers kind of reviewing code um, can also help. And also having, you know, more than one person look at the code or understand a particular piece of the code also helps reduce the knowledge silos. So there's one thing kind of, it's not specifically relegated to the software development world, but there's this thing known as the bus factor. And the bus factor, if you haven't heard of it before, is essentially what is the risk involved if you were to be hit by a bus and be killed tomorrow, what kind of impact would that have on 
whatever you're working on. And if your bus factor is high, that essentially means if you were to be removed immediately, it would take a significant level of effort uh, to basically get someone else up to speed on the work that you were doing. So having multiple people kind of understand different po portions of the code base and kind of reduce these knowledge sil silos helps reduce uh, your overall bus factor. So kind of another example of this is like a junior developer can gain like insights to some maybe more advanced techniques or best practices uh, from the senior developers when being involved in these code reviews that they might not have gotten uh, if they were just kind of writing code themselves. And then kind of similar to the code quality um, portion, but focusing specifically on maintainability, code reviews can also help with that as well. Because one thing that we've also talked on this app on the podcast before is this idea of technical debt, where, you know, unmaintainable code or poorly readable code can incur a lot of technical debt because it makes it a lot harder to uh, make changes or updates to portions of the code base. Um, so ensuring that code is readable um, and you know offering suggestions for improved readability or making it easier to maintain in the future is also something that can come out of code reviews. Um, and also kind of the, the the documentation aspect. So like during the code reviews, um, you know, better, you can discuss, you know, how to better document the code itself uh, in order to make it more readable and maintainable for um, future developers that have to come along and touch that code later. Now, when we're talking about documentation and code, <laughs> it's not like you should be, you're not writing a novel <laughs> about, you know, what's going on in every little nitty gritty detail because well-written code in theory should basically speak for itself of what it's doing because there's there's a saying out there that um, goes something to the effect of code never lies but comments sometimes do um, which basically means that the code of course is what's being done by the computer and instruction by instruction but the comment might have been you know, there before the code was updated and the code now does something slightly differently. Um, so it is one thing that you kind of have to be aware of. And that is one thing that code reviews can definitely catch is those copy and paste mistakes um, where you might have copied code from somewhere else in the code base, pasted it in, forgot to rename a comment or rename a variable or something to that effect. So that's something that code reviews can also catch. Um, but specifically going back to the documentation aspect, for me personally, what I like to do when writing comments in my code is generally I don't I don't do like a line by line thing or even usually if I'm writing functions, I'll have, you know, some kind of whatever the documentation standard is for that language. So if it's like a C or C++, I'll do like Doxygen style documentation. If it's Java, I'll do Java doc. If it's Swift, I'll do docc, I think is what um, Apple calls it. So I'll try to adhere to whatever the documentation standard is for when it comes to like writing function documentation. But then when it comes to like writing in Line documentation for like you know little comments and stuff usually I'll throw something in there like if there's a large um, chunk that isn't in a function itself that does something semi-specific um, maybe write a, a comment in there just so you can kind of see what's going on like going back to the encryption algorithm that I'm writing uh, like for instance the the logic in a larger function that handles the actual encrypting or decrypting part I might put like a brief comment that says perform encryption or something like that just so if you're just skimming through the code you can kind of see it um, or like if I'm doing some kind of more complex um, either algorithm or math operation or something like that, generally I'll throw a comment in there basically kind of giving a brief explanation of what's going on because those are the notorious portions of code bases where in the moment when you write it, it makes complete and total sense. But when you come back to it a couple weeks later, you're sitting there scratching your head for a few minutes wondering what the heck this is doing and why it works. So having like a comment in there to basically briefly explain what's going on can be very beneficial. Um, so but getting into kind of an example here, 
Um, if you're doing some kind of code review, a reviewer could potentially suggest breaking down a more complex function into smaller, more man manageable pieces, which makes the code base a lot easier to understand and then modify in the future. Again, kind of reducing that technical debt. Uh, because if you have a lot smaller functions that have more niche-specific use cases, it makes it a lot easier to kind of reuse and maintain those functions rather than having these big monolithic functions that sometimes have a lot of reuse so you have three different functions that have portions that do the same thing so if you want to modify that one individual component you have to now modify it in three places rather than if you made it its own function you only have to modify it in one so kind of that Im improving the maintainability aspect um, and then increasing the code robustness so kind of as we we touched on um, having more eyes on the code can help improve security. So identifying possible security flaws um, and, and, and ensuring you're practicing, you know, secure coding practices. Um, and then also you can, if you if you have additional people looking at the code, you can potentially identify bottlenecks or performance places where you could potentially have some optimizations. Um, so in, in terms of this robustness and security, one potential um, example here, one thing that we've talked about before when talking about vulnerabilities is SQL injection, injections. So for instance, maybe during a review, um, the reviewer identifies a potential security vulnerability in a database query where the user inputs uh, data directly and that gets pumped directly into an SQL injection and the re reviewer can suggest parameter parameterizing uh, the queries or sanitizing the queries in order to prevent uh, SQL injections. And then kind of one of the other last components is kind of the, the team building and communication aspect. So one thing that can sometimes happen, it, it kind of depends on what your team's culture is when it comes to your your software developers, especially if you're remote, um, having interaction with one another could potentially be minimal uh, because generally speaking, software developers don't get involved in many meetings because they're busy writing code. Um, so if you're if you're not kind of all together in an office together, you might not necessarily kind of get that collaboration, that feedback with one another. So having these code reviews can be um, kind of avenues for that. So code reviews can also foster a kind of a, a culture of constructive feedback and open communication within the team. Because one thing that you don't want is people to be kind of scared. Like if you're doing code reviews, you don't want people to be nervous or scared about having their code going through a code review because you you don't they don't you don't want someone to be worried that they're going to get beaten down and kind of destroyed because you know they forgot a semicolon or something or they uh, forgot to check for a null case or something like that uh, so kind of the goal that you kind of want to foster in these code reviews and what what's good what can be good about them is kind of this idea of um, building up kind of the I guess the morale of the team and kind of empowering one another through these reviews and discuss you know kind of the best approaches approaches for practices and whatnot and kind of just have kind of a little bit of a team building thing if you will like during these code reviews so one thing we kind of talked about a few weeks ago kind of with like the whole scrum meetings with agile like sometimes you can have scrum meetings that are really boring and bland and just this is what I'm working on. This is what I worked on yesterday. I don't have any issues. Next person, very bland and boring. Or your scrum meetings could essentially be kind of a, a group hangout where you just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze, if you will, kind of having a good time. And oh, yeah, by the way, we're also talking about what we're planning on doing and if we have any issues. Um, so you could potentially kind of try to mix that into uh, your your code reviews as to kind of, you know, have some fun with it as well. Um, so getting into some of the kind of downsides of code reviews. So we talked a lot about some of the positives uh, that code reviews can have, but there's also um, some negatives as, as well. And the first one of those being time consuming because 
One thing that developers probably hate, uh, trust me, I know, uh, is meetings. Now, if you're new to the professional world, you might be jealous of people that are in a lot of meetings because you think they're important. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> when you get sucked into a lot of meetings, kind of the only thing that you want in life is to not have many meetings, which is is this really weird irony, right? When you don't have any meetings, especially when you're new, you want to be in a lot of meetings because that makes you feel important. But then when you're in a lot of meetings because you are important, <laughs> you don't want to be in any meetings because when you're in meetings, you can't really get the work done that you need to. Anyway, that, that kind of tangent aside. Uh, but the point here is code reviews do slow down the development process, especially depending on how long the review cycle is, how long the code is open for review. It can potentially slow down your delivery process to be able to push out code. Now, one of the kind of some of the mitigation strategies here would be having making sure you have clear guidelines um, for the review processes, making sure that there's kind of like a, a pipeline in place to help mitigate this and potentially having automated tools in place as well uh, to do like automated checks for things like you could have like linter tools um, or tools like, um, you know, like a Clang format or something like that to auto format code. So you don't necessarily have to worry about certain portions that might otherwise come up during a code review. Um, and then another issue that could potentially come up in code reviews is conflicts. So, of course, anytime you're having any kind of meeting or group of people coming together, uh, there, there's almost always going to have the potential for some kind of conflict, whether that's a difference in opinion on approaches or how code should be written, styles, whatever the case is, there's a chance that there could be conflicts that come up uh, during these code reviews. Um, but of course, kind of one thing, some things that you can kind of do to help mitigate that is kind of kind of like what we said um, uh, when we talked about facilitating the team communication, kind of ensuring that um, you kind of encourage that behavior of, you know, respectful, constructive feedback and focusing on the code rather than the coder themselves. Because one thing that can sometimes happen potentially specifically kind of with, with junior developers someone or someone that's new to the team is depending on how you fee or how you phrase your feedback, they the person on the receiving end may take that as you kind of getting at them rather than the code itself. So you want to always make sure that you're focusing specifically on the code and not at the person that wrote the code in order to help reduce conflicts. But kind of, like I said too, like some of the, the style components, that's one reason why style guides are generally very important, especially if you're working with a, a larger team or working on a massive code base. Because if you have the style guide, that instantly eliminates some of these disputes that people you know, will have. Because one thing, if you don't have a style guide, people can be very adamant in their beliefs of how they believe that code should be formatted and the various naming conventions and all that sort of stuff. But if you have a style guide in place, you know, all those kind of go away because you can objectively refer to the style guide and say, no, this is not how we do things. It's done this way. Why is it done this way? Because the style guide says so. Now, of course, you can have a, an argument later on whether the style guide's correct or not, but you at least have objective evidence to say, this is why we do it, and it's because it's written here, and this is what we follow. So, you you know, you, you can be objective in that way. Um now, specifically when it comes to style guides, kind of like I mentioned, um, if you you can use like some kind of auto code formatter. So we kind of talked about like automated tools for kind of these code reviews. So some kind of automated code formatting tool, like a Clang format or a Swift format, uh, to help format your code before it even gets to code review, so you can kind of eliminate. Um, some of those. Um, another kind of downside is over reliance on reviews. So there could be a potential that if you're doing a code review for every single change that gets made that gets put into production, 
Some developers might get lazy and take advantage of this and write sloppy code because if they know it's going to get reviewed by someone else anyway, they don't necessarily have to worry if they forget a couple edge cases because someone else is going to catch it. And then that's where if everyone kind of thinks that way and if your reviews kind of happen so much and you re overly rely on them, you might think, oh, I don't really have to worry. Someone else is going to catch it and you kind of get into this uh, you know, loop of someone else will do it, and then that's how things can slip through the cracks and you get bugs ending up in your production code. Um, so kind of what you really need to focus on is while code reviews are important, you also have to focus on the importance of writing quality code from the get-go and using things like automated tests um, to help balance this so you can ensure that you catch those edge cases ahead of time so you're not necessarily always relying on some senior dev to check for edge cases that you might be missing in your code. Um, but uh, getting back to some actual real-world uh, solutions of code reviews. So the Linux kernel project specifically uses code reviews quite frequently um, to review any code coming in from the maintainers and contributors. And I mean, if you think about it, the Linux kernel, literally anyone could make changes to the Linux kernel and push those changes. So this is an instance where you really want to ensure that you're reviewing the code coming through uh, because since anyone can make changes to the code, you need to make sure that those changes are actually legitimate uh, before you get them get them merged in. But the kind of the benefit here is because there's so much scrutiny to all these changes, it generally um, has a high you know quality level pretty secure and stable um, and which is one of the reasons why the virtually the entire internet is is run on Linux um, then when it comes to enterprises I mean basically any large enterprise is going to be using code reviews specifically Google I think is pretty well known uh, for their code reviews being a mandatory part of their development process um, to you know basically to ensure that the the high quality of the code that's actually being deployed um, so getting into some kind of uh, like a basically kind of a real world example to tie all this in. So we're going to assume there's some random company out there called XYZ Corporation because we're very good with our naming conventions. So XYZ Corp just recently adopted a code review process to improve the quality of their code for a customer facing web application. Um, so before you know anything gets merged in, they the developers have to create a pull request, which essentially means that you have your you you have your mainline branch, and then basically all the developers are either working off a fork of that, or they're working off a separate branch in that mainline. And then when they ever whenever they want their changes to be included back in the mainline, they basically make a pull request, which is where you know they're basically saying to all the other developers, hey, I want these changes to be included in the mainline branch and then that'll, that'll go through some kind of review process uh, so it'll go through like an automated check so do, going through the automated tests linters um, and all that stuff to basically catch those those basic errors and enforce the coding standards so that would be your things like your automated test suite going through if you're writing like a um, whether that's if you have some kind of for auto formatter um, go through that to basically get rid of some of those common things that would come up in code reviews otherwise. And then, of course, it goes through the, the manual review process where you it can kind of vary depending on the team. But in this case, we'll say two uh, team members will independently review the code and provide feedback or any suggestions. And if they do provide any suggestions, the, the developer themselves will have to take those into consideration, possibly make some changes, and then update that. And then once all that that goes through there can be some additional discussion um, based on the feedback provided and then assuming all that looks good the merge is then approved and then get or the pull request is then approved and then gets merged back into the mainline once all the reviewers are satisfied uh, with the changes that have been made to the code and then the outcome here is you have a, a more quality 
code based um, and you, you have fewer bugs um, and you have you know better maintainable code and you know ensure your your coverage your test coverage is good you're not missing edge cases and that kind of thing because you have those things such as the automated test cases the manual review kind of looking over the code and you have those things like the linters or the code formatters to basically ensure that your code falls in line uh, with the rest of the code so kind of to to wrap things up here the the kind of the key takeaways for the benefits of code reviews is kind of ensure improving the qual quality of the code and the consistency improving and enhancing team collaboration and knowledge sharing uh, having better maintainability and robustness of the code and reducing you know that technical debt and then facilitating communication and consensus within the team but of course there are the few, the few minor downsides of course that being the time consuming process of actually performing the code review because if you're reviewing other people's code that of course takes away time from you actually writing code yourself and contributing and then there's of course the potential for possible conflicts to come up during those code review processes and then the overall reliance on code reviews where some might get sloppy but overall uh, to, to kind of give the, the final thoughts here and to summarize, despite the challenges and some of the drawbacks, I, I think in general code reviews are do have a net benefit um, and, and are, are generally, if you're developing code in an enterprise, it's definitely something that you should be striving for and aiming for to ensure uh, you, know, you have a robust code base, you minimize your technical debt. Um, and improve the maintainability of your code. Because no matter how long that you've been coding for, we all make mistakes and we all overlook edge cases. Um, literally this episode, I talked about that edge case I overlooked where I didn't check a null case, right? So we all make mistakes. And just like when you're writing papers or emails or any sort of official documents, it's always good to get a second set of eyes on your work to help catch any kind of minor grammatical errors or any minor things that you might have missed. Because just like with writing, when you look at it for long enough, your brain will tend to fill in the errors or overlook mistakes. Now, one way that I've kind of heard and kind of works for me at least with writing in particular, not, not code writing, but like writing papers and emails and all that stuff, is if you say the words out loud, it can kind of help... Uh, help uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It can help you catch some of those minor things that when you're just reading it quietly to yourself, you can overlook or like, you know, you, you wrote the wrong version of there, or you forgot, or you're filling in an and where there, there none exists, or you have a double like or a double word that you, you overlook if you're just reading it. So that's something that can help, but also having someone else look at it can be beneficial too, because I don't know about you, but I've noticed if I if I write something and kind of step away from it for a significant period of time, whether that's uh, come back to it the next day or a few hours later, whatever the case may be, I'll generally catch more errors because I was you know had some time to kind of step away from it and kind of coming at it with fresh eyes. And the same thing is true with code because um, you know especially if you're running the same tests over and over and over again, your focus, you can kind of get laser focused specifically on making those tests that you wrote pass and then possibly overlook certain edge cases that others could potentially catch if they're just looking at the code for the first time. So essentially by integrating, you know, code reviews into your team's development workflow, you can kind of improve the overall um, collaboration with the team, improve the software quality, and just, you know, improve the overall software development experience. So I think we got on long enough about code reviews. Uh, so let's wrap this up with the trivia question. So what American tech company had a microprocessor facility in Costa Rica that at one time was responsible for 20% of Costa Rican exports and 5% of the company's GDP? If you said Intel, congratulations, you got this week's trivia question correct. Correct. 
Um, and I guess with that, if you enjoyed the episode, I ask that you leave it a rating and review and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And definitely be sure to share this around if you have any uh, friends or family members that are software developers. This might be beneficial to them since we talk quite a bit about code reviews. And if you have any questions about this episode or if you have any topics or ideas for future episodes, you can shoot me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com or you can click the link down in the show notes below and then of course if you're on youtube you can just leave a comment and that's going to do it for me in this episode of the dark assassins podcast until next time my fellow assassins remember bull nothing equals true if action not equal to null return true i'll see you next time on the dark assassins podcast